All right, so let's start. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Barnes. He's an economic geologist working at Cicero uh, in Australia, one of the world's largest mineral research facilities, where he's a research leader for the ore system science team. He received his bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Cambridge, followed by his PhD in geology from the University of Toronto in 1983. And since then, he's been a part of the Cicero research team for the last uh, more than 35 years, where he most recently served as the research leader for the Mineral Resource Group from 2014 to 19. He's published in over 180 uh, peer-reviewed submissions, accounting for maybe almost 8,000 citations. And in addition to his wildly successful academic career, Steve has worked in exploration for platinum group element deposits in Australia, Canada, and the United States. He has also served on the board, editorial board of economic geology. He is, Steve is widely recognized as a world leader in magmatic, nickel, chromium, and PGE deposits hosted in mafic and ultramafic rocks. And with that, I would like to offer the figurative floor to Dr. Steve Barnes to teach us more about time and length scales of magnetic sulfide systems. Well, good. All right, so what I um, want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is to give you a talk which really falls into two parts. The first is about a particular approach of looking at mineral systems, thinking about them in terms of multiple length and time scales. So I'll take you through that. Um, and then the second part of the talk, I'll attempt to show you how we actually apply that to a real case study. I'm going to talk about the Nova deposit in Western Australia, which is one of the most recently discovered significant nickel sulfide deposits um, anywhere. Um, and um, just, uh, just in passing, I'll note that uh, just um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we've had a new Greenfields nickel discovery in Western Australia, which uh, we're very excited about. It's only, uh, it's less than 100 kilometers away from Perth. Um, it's uh, called Julemar, and um, complete Greenfields discovery. And uh, it, it's early days yet, so we don't know what it's going to turn into, but it's... Uh, it's pretty exciting to think that uh, we're still finding these things um, in places that people have been walking over and driving past for, uh, for, for, for many, many years. So, um, right, so into the talk. So I'll, I'll start with this diagram. Anybody who's heard me talk about nickel deposits before has probably seen this one. Um, this is the typical sort of helicopter view of a mineral system, in this case, a nickel sulfide system, that we often, that we often see these sorts of cartoons when people talk about mineral systems. So here we've got magma generated in, in the mantle. It's traversing the crust through a sill dike network and producing deposits somewhere along this fluid flow path. Now, I'm not going to say anything very much about this at this stage, except just to point out the one aspect of the diagram, which I normally completely gloss over. Um, and that's the one down here in the bottom left-hand corner. That's a matter of scale. And scale is really what I want to talk about for the next half hour or so. We're, we're really used to looking at these sorts of genetic process cartoons, but typically we don't draw them to scale. And particularly we don't consider scale in the fourth dimension. That's the dimension of time. Um, and it's actually just as important as the spatial dimensions for understanding how mineral systems work. So if you take one thing away from this talk, um, then, um, then, then, then make it that one. Um, so I'm going to talk about length scales and time scales and how they interact in complex physical systems. So I'm going to start out with an analogy. This is a beautiful picture of a big storm cell thunderstorm somewhere in the Midwestern USA. Um, these, um, these things make really nice analogies to mineral systems because basically what they are, they're big 100 to 1000 kilometer scale physical systems that are hoovering up huge amounts of mass, heat and momentum at a continental scale and funneling it all into one place. And that's quite a nice analogy for what mineral systems do to make ore deposits. So now the way fluid dynamicists and meteorologists look at these kinds of systems, try to understand them, is they break them down into multiple component processes at a whole range of different scales. So what we're actually dealing with here is a raft of multi-scale processes. Um, and they range from fast processes happening at small scales um, up to um, slow processes happening at large scales. And I'll show you what I mean. Like for example, condensation of raindrops which is actually one of the major thermal driving forces that make these systems work in the first place. So then we can go through to, to medium scale processes like formation of clouds, um, and then big scale processes operating in a continental context, which in this case would be big continent scale global atmospheric weather systems. Now a storm cell is embedded in one of these large slow process systems. Um, the thing that links all of these is that all of these processes feed into one another. So we've got a nested set of processes that go from fast intermediate processes at short time scales, one end, um, through to large, effectively continuous slow processes at the other. 
So we could think of these as hares and tortoises in the old uh, Aesop's fable story. So that's the term I'll, I'll be using as we go along. Okay, so um, so far so interesting, but how can that kind of process thinking actually help us? So to answer that, I'm going to use this diagram. Um, and this is, um, this is the diagram which was first introduced to me by a former postdoc of mine, Jesse Robertson, um, who's just uh, moved back to New Zealand. Um, so I, I call them Jessograms. These things are, are fairly widely used in the, uh, in, in, in the physics world. Uh, Jesse's a fluid physicist, and this is basically how he in, in, intu in, intuitively thinks about these kinds of things. So what we've got is a length scale, time scale plot. We've got time on the horizontal axis, there's about 18 log units there, going from milliseconds to all the way through to the age of the Earth. Um, and, um, and then on the vertical axis, we've got about 16 log units of length going from nanometers to the radius of the Earth. So literally, absolutely any process on the planet can be plotted somewhere on this diagram, and we can look at them all at once and see how they interact. So there's, that's one fundamental principle behind this. At any given length scale, the fastest process, so the one with the shortest time scale, is going to be the dominant one. And you'll see what I mean as I go along. So here's an example for a global weather system. We can put on some of the, uh, some of the examples that I showed you from the storm cell on here. So we can put here, here, here are our, um, droplet microphysics. Um, we can see clouds. Um, we can see the, the, the storm cell um, and then um, large scale atmospheric oceanic circulation systems um, all, all plotted here. Um, and um, one, one, one thing you notice is that um, they, they define a linear array um, and the, the, the position and the slope of that linear array um, is, 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 is informative because what that actually tells you is what the sort of resistive force is um, that all of these processes have to overcome. And in this case, it's essentially the viscosity of the ocean atmosphere system. Um, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we're going to see this in a minute and see this how, how this plays out in geological sorts of systems. So now let's go back to our magmatic system. Here we are back at our big uh, crustal scale mineral system. And now let's try and play the same game. So, um, and what really helps to construct these kinds of diagrams to understand what the fundamental physical controls are in these geological systems. So, um, what are the uh, what are the hares and tortoises? So, um, so here we go. Here's a gesogram for magmatic processes. Um, and there are really th three families of processes. First, there's magmatic flow, which is up in the uh, up, up in the top left-hand corner here, this blue array, that's a major variable. Um, and um, time scales for mag magma flow velocities form a, form a linear array, which sits up here in the top left-hand corner. Um, these are the hairs, if you like, in our system. Um, now, the, the, the next sort of family of processes um, are ones which are controlled by thermal diffusion. So these are processes which govern how fast magmas lose heat to the country rock. It's a really fundamental control, flows into a lot of other processes. Um, and uh, Thermal diffusion processes tend to plot along that pink line. Then um, a third set of processes, chemical diffusion processes. These govern things like, for example, how crystals grow in magmas, um, how sulfide liquid droplets interact, um, and uh, other processes along those kinds of lines. Um, the takeaway point here is the position of these lines. Chemical diffusion is several orders of magnitude slower than thermal diffusion. Um, so it only really matters at very small length scales. At long length scales, it's too slow to really be, be important. So this is a good point to introduce um, this um, physical scaling law, which says that the length scale of any sort of diffusive process is related to the square root of the time scale times the diffusivity that happens to be controlling it. So whether that's thermal, chemical, or, or whatever it is. So just with that one simple equation, we can actually go a really long way. We don't have to solve a lot of complicated differential equations. Most of the time, we can get at what we want to know on the back of an envelope just using that one simple scaling rule. So if you remember two things from this talk, remember this one. So, okay, how do we use it? So here, here's some geological processes now on the scaling diagram. Um, and the thing in common with, with all of the ones that I'm gonna show you here is that these are all processes which are directly observable. We actually know the time scale that these processes happen on because we can either see them in real time or we can access them with geochronology. So for example, lava flow. This is lava flowing out of the end of a lava tube on Kilauea from a few years ago. This tells us the typical sort of instantaneous flow velocities for basaltic magmas. And they're the order of around about a meter per second, give or take an order of magnitude or so. So now let's look, go up a scale, and let's look at the, um, the, 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 the scale for individual large lava flows or so individual volcanic events. Um, uh, large lava flows are typically made up of individual eruptive pulses, and they typically operate over months to years and tens or maybe even hundreds of kilometers. And we know that because we can, we can watch them happen in places like Hawaii. Um, so now we'll move on to another one. These are processes in, um, 
in lava tubes. And these are processes where, 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 where lavas interact with their country rocks to the point where they can actually melt and erode them. And this is a really important process for us because we know that this is a key part of the process of forming, of forming water deposits. And again, we know how fast this happens. It's actually been observed. Um, lava, lava tubes erode their floor of, on, uh, at, at rates of the order of tens of centimeters over days. So if we extend that out over longer periods of time, we can see where we sit here on the time scale length scale plot. And we're in the order of sort of cent centimeters to meters over days, or extending that out um, orders of maybe tens of meters um, over months to years. So now let's look at some large scale volcanic switching events. I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. But um, this, is a, this is a thermal image of the summit crater of Kilauea a few years ago. Um, the volcano is basically moving around large swimming pools full of magma on a time scale of minutes to hours, um, and large tanks of magma on much bigger scales on orders of, of, of days or less. And we'll talk, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail later on. So now let's go out to bigger scales. So the, the time scale for individual shield volcanoes. Um, this is about probably the same as the time scale for forming large mafic intrusions like the Bushveld complex. Um, and these are forming on the order of hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years um, on length scales of hundreds of kilometers. Um, and finally, the biggest thing we really deal with in these kinds of systems, um, and that's large igneous provinces. So here's the Siberian flood basalt province. This is the host of the Nuril score deposits, 2,000 kilometers across, um, several million cubic kilometers of magma. And all of this happens within about 2 million years. So that kind of gives you an idea. All right, so now let's go back to um, a model for how we think magmatic sulfide deposits form and then try and fit this back into this diagram. So um, we have magma flowing through some sort of a conduit system. That magma is interacting with its wall rocks um, and it's incorporating uh, sulfur out of the wall rocks by a variety of possible mechanisms. And that makes immiscible sulfide liquid. Now the sulfide liquid has to interact with that magma and scavenge metals out of the magma. Um, now we've somehow rather got to actually extract that sulfide liquid from the magma and deposit it in some sort of deposition site um, and by some mechanism or, the, or, 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 or rather actually get, get the sulfide droplets to segregate from the magma and accumulate. Now that's where we used to think the story ended, but actually what we now know from what we've been doing in the last few years is that it doesn't end there. Sulfide liquids are actually quite mobile and we're going to be seeing a lot of evidence of that in the latter part of this talk. So a fundamental question for exploration is, if you want to design an exploration program based around this sort of conceptual model, what sort of length scales are involved? How far away are deposition sites from our sulfide incorporation sites? That's a really fundamental question if you're designing an exploration program around a genetic model. Now to get to that, we need to know what sort of time scales are operating for the component fast processes. So let's look at the first one. We'll look at how we actually incorporate sulfur into magma. Um, so I'm going to set up a little bit of a straw man argument here, but it's useful to demonstrate how this way of thinking helps to get us answers. So this is the classic conduit model. This originates from the work of Noldris and others back in the 80s and 90s, and it's still prevalent in various forms to this day. So um, here we have a magma flowing through some sort of conduit system, deriving sulfur from the wall rock and dumping it in a trap site. Um, and in this, in this scheme, there are two ways basically to get sulfide into the magma. One is to actually physically assimilate the wall rocks, um, and the other is to sweat the sulfur out of the thermal aureole as a result of contact metamorphic reactions. And both of these kinds of models have been, uh, have been appealed to um, in, in um, various different publications over many years. Um, so, the, so the first piece of the low hanging fruit here for our scaling analysis is to test, test one, which one of these is plausible. And the answer turns out to be fairly simple. So if we look at the, the length scale of tens to hundreds of meters, that's the scale on the thickness of the intrusions and the thickness of the thermal aureole that we would actually need to sweat our sulfur out of. Well, thermal aureole formation. So that, that's, that's sort of the range of length scales we want to look at. Um, now, small intrusions um, will... Uh, Will, will solidify over time scales of hundreds to thousands of years. So we're sitting here on our diagram. Thermal aureole formation is a slower process than that. Or, um, thermal aureoles form on the sort of scale we need um, on time scales of tens to thousands of years. Um, and that's because they're controlled by thermal conductivity. So they sit on that thermal conductivity line that I showed you earlier. Um, now the other process which is important, the one I alluded to earlier, um, and that's the process of thermal erosion. Um, uh, now again, this, this sits on the, um, on the thermal conductivity line, um, but um, a little bit above it because melting is actually substantially enhanced by convective processes which bring hot magma to the contact. Now we, we know how fast this happens, we've got direct observations on thermal erosion beneath active lava flows. And we know that country rock melting can happen over meters on a scale of days. And that's well within the expected time scale of continuous flow of magma through a silt. 
um, or, or through, a, through any sort of small intrusion. Whereas scar or thermal erosion for, um, formation on the scale we need it takes a lot longer. So in fact, most thermal aureoles around igneous intrusions actually form after the magma stopped flowing. And in fact, after most of the magma is solidified. Um, but now if you think about how far the magma would have flowed, if it had been flowing continuously while that thermal aureole was forming, um, and you can see that um, you can see the problem. Um, so that uh, our magmas would have flowed to the moon and back in the time it actually takes us to make a thermal erosion, that's, a, th a thermal aureole that's, that's big enough. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the main way of getting sulfur into the magma is by actually physically incorporating lumps of sulfide bearing wall rock into the magma, dropping them into the magma and melting them. And that's the process of thermal erosion. It's much faster than, than the, 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 the process of thermal aureole formation. So I've, I've kind of spent a little bit of time explaining that, but that's, um, that's basically um, an illustration of the way this kind of mode of thinking operates. So um, some of the other things on this diagram I'm going to show you, I'm not going to explain as much. I'm going to sort of skip to the, skip to the chase. But, um, but, um, but um, no, basically you see how it works. So now let's have a look at the process of which, which we now think really matters, and that's the process of actually dropping lumps of sulfidic rock into the magma. Um, uh, what, what actually happens when we do that? Well, that, that's a process of basically melting the xenolith as a result of building up a thermal and compositional boundary layers around the xenoliths. Um, there's a whole lot of quite complicated physics around this. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into, into, into detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut to the chase and show you where those things sit on that plot. Um, and typically xenolith melting, we think is happening depending on what the xenoliths are made of and how big they are um, on, on, a, on a time scale of hours and days for um, typical size xenolith rock inclusions that we find inside intrusions. Um, now, what we also need to know is how those zeniths are actually going to be carried in the magma. That depends on, on what those zeniths are made of. Some will float in the magma and not sink at all. Um, some will, will, will be relatively dense and will sink like stones, quite literally. So, the, um, so, so where are zenolith sinkings can be pretty much sort of anywhere on that, um, on that scaling plot. But the important thing is that the process is relatively slow compared to the physical flow of the transporting and eroding magma. What does that mean? Well, it means that zeniths and any sulfide they have in them can be transported a long way by the flowing magma before they melt. And a significant conclusion of that is that sulfide liquid transport in magmas might not actually be as dispersed reactive droplets, which is what the standard models assume. It might actually be within disaggregating zeniths. And that's a bit of a, of a game changer in terms of understanding how we think about these things. But it also gives us an important clue, an important footprint to look for, because the presence of disaggregated zeniths in the magma is a really important signal for this kind of process. Um, and it might also go a long way to explaining why very often when we look at ores, such as um, this, one, uh, this one here, this is a, 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 a classic um, disseminated sulfide ore from the, the giant Nurulsh deposits, we very find an association between sulfides and these so-called taxitic rocks. Now these are extremely heterogeneous rocks. They're full of partially disaggregated and partially melted zeniths. Um, and this is very commonly true in deposits formed from mafic magnets. Now it's much less so for comatiites. Now, why is that? Well, commatiites are much hotter and they're much less viscous, and that means that the time scales for dissolution of zeniths are much shorter. In fact, they're shorter by orders of magnitude. So that, in one sentence, is the major reason why commatiitic deposits typically look a lot different from mafic hosted deposits. Okay, so that's uh, one part of it. Let's move on and think about the sulfide droplets themselves, mixing with the magma and scavenging metals. How long does that process take? Well, again, I won't take you through the uh, I won't take you through the arguments. Um, I'll just show you the results. But the time scale for these kinds of processes, it turns out, is actually really quite slow. Um, and the reason for that is that the, the, um, it, it's a, a process that's controlled by diffusion of sulfur in the magma, and sulfur is, a, is quite a slow diffusing process. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the time scale of these kinds of processes to happen is relatively long compared to the time scale for significant displacement of flow in the magma. In other words, sulfides can be carried a long way in the magma before they dissolve, um, and a lot of the magma that's actually carrying probably doesn't know that the sulfide is there. In other words, sulfides can be carried a long way um, in sulfide undersaturated magma. Now, that's a bit of a game changer because we've always thought one of the basic foundations of the paradigm for many years has been that you need sulfide saturated magmas to make ore deposits. But in fact, once you've got past that initial stage of getting the molten sulfide into the magma, it might commonly happen that a lot of the magma that's actually done the assimilating never actually sees the sulfide and never actually reacts with it. And that might go a long way to explaining why we very rarely see um, the sort of geochemical signals that we might expect to see um, from this kind of process. So the message is chemical equilibration is really slow compared to transport and settling rates. Sulfide can be carried a long way from the source of the magma. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, it means that to actually make an ore deposit, if we want to think about the, the, the way our deposits are being made, then that view that I showed you a little while ago, that sort of instantaneous kind of reaction vessel process where we, where we derive the sulfide from the wall rocks and then drop them on the floor of the intrusion, that's almost certainly completely wrong. Um, we, because those processes are not happening at the right kinds of timescales. So what we, we need to be thinking about the longer length scales and the longer time scales that we need in order to dissolve xenoliths and equilibrate sulfides. Um, and those kinds of time scales are actually much more along the lines of the, of the time scales for um, individual lava flows um, and individual flow fields. Um, in other words, more, more along the lines of sort of tens of kilometers um, and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so now let's go back to the um, go back to our genetic model and start to think about what that actually means for how our ore deposits form. So let's just blow up this little uh, this little section of the uh, of, of the crustal scale cartoon here um, and look at a sill dike network somewhere in somewhere in the middle of the crust. Um, and um, this is um, I apologise for this rather complicated diagram. If you want to um, uh, go into this in a little bit more detail, it's in a paper that we wrote in Ore Geology Reviews in 2016. Um, but I really just want to make one point here, um, that ore forming systems don't just work at one place in time in the crust. They form in trans transcrustal magma transfer networks. Um, so they're, they're, they're part of, of larger sill dike systems which transect the entire crust, and they have a time dimension as well as a space dimension. So, um, and one of the fundamental drivers for forming ore deposits in these kinds of systems might actually not just be um, the, um, the buoyancy and the, and the, the thermal anomaly re re um, represented by the magma, it might actually be the gravitational potential energy that exists in these kinds of systems. Um, and the reason that works is because of the physical properties of sulfide liquids. Uh, sulfide, sulfide liquids are remarkable things. Um, they're, they're really extraordinary substances, they're extremely corrosive, as we'll see. They also have very high density and extremely low viscosities. So if you do actually form a pool of sulfide liquid, then uh, some, somewhere in the crust in one of these kind of 3D magma systems, then what you're, what you're actually trying to do is to balance mercury on a plate. It's almost impossible. So there's going to be a very, very strong tendency if you form a sulfide liquid pool to reactivate it, and particularly to reactivate it downwards. So um, that's a, that, and that's a realization which came to us um, particularly after um, thinking about the sort, of the sort of processes that happen in shield volcanoes. Um, so, uh, so that's a point I'll move on to in a second, but just one, one final point to make. The key thing to make a deposit is that we need to keep these kinds of systems opening, open and operating on large enough scales and on time scales of hundreds of thousands of years or so. So we need long lived continuously operating magnetic systems. So, so this is still the conduit model, but it's a rather more, rather more complicated one than the one we started with. Um, okay, so now let, let's let's go to Hawaii and have a look at a physical analog for these for, for the way these kinds of processes might work. So we know from um, from uh, studies of um, things like radial dike swarms and shield volcanoes, other big crustal scale magmatic systems, that a lot of magma transport in the crust is not so much vertical as lateral, um, and also actually magmas don't necessarily only flow up; they can also flow down. Um, and here's a here's a really fine example of that sort of process. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I've seen, I seem to have skipped some notes here, so I'm going to have to improvise here for a tick. Oh, here we go. Um, so up at the top, lot, top left here, there's, um, that's a picture of the summit crater of, um, of Kilauea. That's the Halima'oma'o summit crater, um, on, uh, visited by many, many millions of people over the years. That, that's, that's what it looked like the last time I was there, which was in the early 19, uh, the, the, the early, um, in early 2018. Um, and um, what we've got there is a caldera. Um, uh, this analogy will be lost on all Australians. It's about the size of the MCG. Um, so it's about the size of a, of a, of, of, of a cricket pitch across. And it's full of lava um, with that uh, transient black crust on it. It's convecting away beautifully, doing all sorts of beautiful little plate tectonic analogs. Um, now, a few days later, um, after that picture was taken, that lava lake was completely drained. And a few months later, it looked like what you see here on the bottom right of this slide. That's a completely collapsed, essentially new cold era. It's more than 10 times the size of the original one. And what that represents is a gigantic withdrawal and collapse from the underlying magma reservoir. And, the, and now, interestingly, the amount of magma that was actually pulled out of that, sorry, I'm just trying to get my cursor back, the amount of magma that was actually pulled out of that um, uh, magma reservoir is about the same sort of order of magnitude of volume as the volume of a typical small intrusion that hosts a nickel sulfide deposit, like, for example, the one at Nova that I'm going to show you 
shortly. Um, so m moving along here, what caused that collapse to happen is that a different part of the plumbing system opened up. Um, so the, um, we're looking at the summit reservoir here. A major eruption broke out about 40 kilometers away down the rift, um, forming these beautiful lava flows here, which a lot of people were watching on their TVs a couple of years ago. Um, wiped out lots of beautiful houses and, and completely obliterated one of my favorite spots on Hawaii. Um, but the, 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 the important thing here for the purposes of this talk is that that process happened on a distance scale of about 40 kilometers away. Um, and that, um, that migration of magma, which was predominantly down and sideways, led to this major collapse of the summer caldera. Um, and um, the, um, the sort of the vertical distance, kind of the elevation distance between here and the summit caldera is of the order of sort of uh, a couple of thousand, uh, about three or four thousand feet, so a um, thousand meters or thereabouts. So that gives you an idea of what sort of length scales magma withdrawal and vertical and horizontal motions happen at. Um, and that's on a time scale of just a matter of a few days. Okay, so now let's go back to our, 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 our model. This is the next stage of the model I showed you earlier, generating sulfide accumulations at different levels in a 3D silt-like plumbing system. So now let's suppose we have a major channel switching event. We drain everything out from the lower level of the, of, of the system. Um, that causes a massive black backflow on, on, on this, on, on, on uh, sort of hundreds of meters, kilometer scale. Um, everything drains back down and accumulates in choke points within that network. Um, and that I think is the major mechanism for forming liquid sulfide deposits. Um, it explains a lot of the features that we see in a whole variety of different deposits. Um, it explains a lot of the, the textual features, including some of the ones that I'm going to show you in a bit. Um, that process happens probably on a time scale of hours to days. So now let's, um, let's take this a little bit further. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to introduce another analogy. This was suggested to me a few years ago by my good friend and colleague, Reed Keyes. Um, and that's the notion of an elutriation column. Now, elutriation is an industrial process. It's used for separating solids from slurries. Um, and the way it operates is you have some sort of a vertical pipe up which you pump a suspension. That's a fluid with entrained denser particles in it. Um, in this case, this would be magma with sulfide droplets in it. Now, if you can adjust it in such a way that the particles are settling at the same rate as the upward flow, then you can produce really efficient segregation of your particles from the fluid. And that's the way these things are used in industry. Now, if you keep this going, keep the flow going faster than the settling rate, you can keep those particles suspended and you can transport them through the crust. Um, so, um, and that's the way to keep your, to dissolve a lot of your zeniths and keep your sulfide reacting with the magma and generate ore deposits. So I would see these ore forming systems as being basically large crustal scale elutriation conduits. But for most of the life of the system on time scales of tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of years, you're pumping magma through it and training the sulfide, keeping it in temporary reservoirs and continually reacting and enriching it. And it's only at the end stage, um, the backflow stage that the system collapses um, and the, um, the extraction of the, of, of the sulfide droplets happens to form the water deposit. Of course, that's the last thing that happens. And that's another interesting sort of takeaway point. It's the last thing you see. And, and as so often in geology, the problem is, the problem in interpretation is that the only thing we see is the last thing that happened. Okay, so let's come back to the length scale, time scale story. I'll just summarize some of the major conclusions here. Um, magma flow is the fastest of the essential processes. Um, the rate of melting of zeniths is a really important control on how you actually make the sulfide liquid. Um, the sulfide liquid might actually be transported fairly largely within melting zeniths. When you do exolve sulfide droplets, they tend to settle at a rate much faster than they can actually react with the magma. But putting all of that together, ore formation requires a multi-stage multi -stage recycling in long-lived conduit systems. Um, now, if you want to um, read a bit more about that, um, we have a, um, a paper in... Um, uh, front, um, uh, Geoscience Frontiers, um, uh, Barnes and Robertson published a couple of years ago, um, and there was supposed to be a QR link to that on this slide, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, I think it's there at the end of the talk. Um, so um, that's an open access paper, so you can download it and, um, and see a bit more about some of the, uh, so, some of the so, sort of the details that go into the construction of this diagram. Um, and um, this has become a little bit of a sort of obsession for me now, so I'm now working on doing one of these for, 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 for layered intrusions. So that's going to be sort of the next, uh, the next installment in the story um, once I figure out how to, uh, how to actually solve the, a lot of the, uh, the, the fundamental problems of how you actually derive rates for processes in layered intrusions. It's not simple. Okay, so now we'll move on to the second part of the talk. Um, and that's about how we actually apply these sorts of thinking to a real order deposit. So, um, so, so we're, we're now in the, um, 
Albany Fraser origin, which sits down here in the bottom left-hand corner of the Yogan Craton, and we're sitting in a, in a Proterozoic origin. The Fraser zone, these are rocks mostly about 1,300 to 1,400 million years old. Um, and uh, Nova sits in the middle of this, um, in the middle of um, a, a, a big, uh, what's essentially a big sill sediment complex. Um, continental margin metasedimentary rocks, very extensively invaded by a huge volume of mafic sills, um, and metamorphosed to granulite facies. And one of these sills is the Nova body. Um, this is a long section through the Nova system looking north. Um, and there are two important systems here, the upper one, the upper intrusion. This is a pretty much conventional um, cyclically layered, layered intrusion, composed mostly of ultramafic and uh, nor noritic rocks, um, norites and peroxonites down towards the marginal zone. Very little sulfide, a little bit towards the basal contact. Um, and then sitting underneath that um, is the lower intrusion, which is the host of pretty much all of your bodies. So if we have a look at that in 3D, um, that's a view of, um, uh, of uh, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, leapfrog model from, uh, from, from IGO. Um, and at this point, I'd just like to thank IGO, uh, Independence Group, for permission to actually show this data and for also funding this, the, uh, the um, extensive study that we've been doing there over about the last three years, which we actually just finished um, uh, with Valentina, Valentina Taranovich and others. Um, so looking down on top of that lower intrusion, um, with the upper intrusion removed, what you see is a sort of green blob that's an elongate, roughly tube-shaped intrusion with lots of small finger-like projections on the left-hand end. Uh, and if we look along the axis of that intrusion, um, you can see it's a sort of lozenge shape in cross-section. This is a classic example of what we call a chonolith. It's an elongate tube-shaped intrusion. It's about as thick as it's wide, but much longer than both dimensions. I'll show you what it's made of in a second. Um, the red and orange are the ore bodies. Um, and as you can see, a large proportion of the ore bodies actually sit not in the intrusion itself, um, but out in the country rock. So now let's have a look and see what this is made of. Um, I'll show you a few of these kinds of images, so I'll just spend a second explaining it. This is an XRF element map, um, and this is made by taking a piece of drill core, rastering un under an X-ray beam. Um, this, this particular one was done on a device called a, a Brooker Tornado, XRF desktop micromapper. Um, so we measure the concentrations of, uh, of basically collect an EDS spectrum um, on a grid of around about 40 microns. Um, and then uh, for, for this particular map, what I've done is I've combined three elements, chromium, iron, and calcium, um, that works particularly nicely um, for these kinds of rocks. Um, and uh, we can see it, it, it nicely resolves the different phases. We can see olivine in a sort of dark greenish color. Um, we can see um, orthoperoxine in these sort of greeny browny colors. Um, and uh, sulfide is the bright green. Um, and clinoperoxine is in the pinky colors. The reason you're seeing different colors within individual phases, in fact, within individual grains like here, um, is that these peroxines are distinct, distinctively zoned. We'll get into that in a second. Um, this is a really distinctive characteristic kind of texture. It's really characteristic of the mineralized intrusion at NOVA. We've got these cauliflower-like clusters of orthoperoxine grains sitting in an open framework of cumulus olivine. Some of that olivine has dendritic crystal shapes. We can see some of that over here and some of it over here. Um, and that indicates rapid growth from the supercooled liquid. So this is essentially an olivine peroxine, olivine orthoperoxine orthocumulate, but with a really unusual texture. Um, so a couple of other images to show variations on this theme. Um, so that's an XRF map at the top, a phase image at the bottom, translates these colors into the actual minerals. Um, and then over here on the right-hand side is another XRF map. Um, it's a blow-up of that part of the map. The green and orange things that you can see again are orthoperoxine grains. And you can see in the middle of them, you get these complicated concentric patterns. Um, these are due to variations in the chromium content. Um, and these patterns reflect a variety of different types of zoning that's developed in these peroxine grains. So let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail. This is another type of XRF map. Um, this is actually a synchrotron map. Um, and um, in, in here, um, we're, we're, we're seeing, again, orthoproxene is in the sort of greeny orange colors. Um, and this sort of bow tie type feature you can see here is a very distinctive kind of zoning. It's called sector zoning. Um, and that sector zoning is a characteristic of rapid growth of peroxine crystals under circumstances where diffusion of a component in the melt, chromium in the melt, can't quite keep up with the growth of the crystal. And the reason we get those patterns is because chromium actually likes to, likes to partition into particular crystal faces of, of the peroxine more than others. Um, so now the implications of that are pretty interesting and we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. But the, so the main takeaway here is that the textures we see in the rocks, firstly, we've got olivine and, olivine and orthoperoxine accumulating together. Um, and the second is that both of those phases seem to have actually crystallized pretty fast. Um, now, there are a lot of other aspects of Nova geology which seem to follow from the fact that it cooled extremely slowly. 
So how do we reconcile those kinds of processes? Now, the other things these rocks have in them are called symplectites. This is another XRF map. This is from the Australian synchrotron. Um, this is a chromium ion titanium map. Um, and now if we, we, we'll just blow an area of that up. These complicated sort of wormy things you're seeing here are actually integrates of amphibole, orthoproxene, clinoproxene, and spinel. Um, and these things are actually the result of a reaction, which I hope you can read at the top there, um, the, the reaction between olivine and plagioclase, um, plus a melt component, gives hornblende spinel and orthoproxene. Um, and these hornblende spinel symplectides replace the, 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 the plagioclase, um, and the orthoproxene replaces the olivine. Um, now, we, we think we can make a case that these things have to be starting to form while they still actually melt in the rock. Um, this little cartoon there showing that process. Um, and uh, knowing that, we can then use these phase assemblages. We can plug our phase, uh, our, our, our modal uh, mineralogy and our phase compositions into thermocalc. Um, we can get a pressure temperature out of it. Um, and what we find is that um, these rocks were forming somewhere at around about 0.8 to 0.9 gigapascals. Um, and um, a, a solidus temperatures in the rock of around about sort of 10, 50 degrees. And then they'll probably continue to react down temperature to lower temperatures than that. Um, but basically these intrusions on the basis of this, or this particular intrusion, was in place around about 25 to 30 kilometers depth. These magmas are in place deep in the crust. That's a really significant conclusion. So um, now we've got some other lines of evidence as well, not only the symplectites, we've got um, high aluminium peroxines with spinelic solution in them. Um, we've got low chromium aluminium rich magmatic spinels forming as uh, cumulus phases. These things only form at high pressures. Um, and then the sulfide in infiltration textures, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, and basically these um, conditions that we've, that we've deduced here from the symplectites are contiguous with the regional metamorphic grade of the rocks. The regional granulite facies metamorphic grade. In other words, these intrusions were in place at the metamorphic peak. Okay, so now let's look, have a look at sulfides. Um, and uh, this is a very schematic image. Um, this is not a real geology map. It's sort of a highly stylized version, but it's just there to show you how the different um, ore, ore textures um, relate to one another. So the purple stuff are the ultramafic rocks of the lower intrusion. The sort of dotty orange and purple stuff um, are net textured and disseminated sulfides forming in the lower part of the intrusion. Um, the yellow and green stuff are the uh, country rocks. These are granulite facies, paranises, and mafic, mafic granulites. Um, and then here's some of the different kinds of sulfide textures that we see in the sulfides developed within the country rocks. A whole variety of different sulfide breccia textures, sulfide dikes and veins with all sorts of interesting reaction lines. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to focus on mainly um, are these what are called soft wall sulfide breccias and infiltration textures. So let's have a look at, a, at these things in a little bit more detail. Um, this is what they look like. So this, uh, I should say this is actually one of the most spectacular oil bodies I've ever seen anywhere underground with some just really quite extraordinarily beautiful textures, magnificently preserved. Um, the ground's really fantastic, so you can spend a lot of time uh, rummaging around and looking at, a, at, at a beautiful exposures. Um, so the upper part of the image on the left here um, is basically a matrix of sulfide with rafts of disaggregating fragments of garnet granulites floating around in it. Um, and um, they're, they're disaggregating to different degrees. I'll show you in close up what they, those look like in a second. Um, and then down at this interface, we see going into the granulites down here, we see a vein of sulfide cutting into the gneisses. Um, and off the walls of the veins, um, we've got secondary veinlets, which are infiltrating along the foliation of the sulfides. Um, here's another one of these interfaces close up. Sulfides with nice fragments at the top. Um, and at the bottom, we've got uh, garnet bearing gneisses with sulfide veins infiltrating it, sulfide percolating um, along the foliation. Um, and what we're dealing with here is a sulfide infiltration melting front, where the sulfide is melting its way into the country rocks. Um, now, at, at the top of one of these things, where we get a high proportion of sulfide, the country rock actually starts to break up, lumps of it disaggregate, detach, float off into the sulfide, and make these remarkable sort of jellyfish blobs um, this is a photo from uh, the former mine geologist there, Seb Stauder, um, from the early days of the Nova mine. And uh, these, these dark areas here are the more refractory um, peroxine granulite um, layers of the, of, of the paranises. Here they are in close up. And an and, uh, interesting thing happens you can see that, that, that they're deforming um, ductilely in most cases, but in some places they're actually cracking. Um, and where they crack, you get these beautiful little sort of V shaped fracks, cra uh, V shaped cracks which fill in with sulfide. This is all happening under magmatic conditions. Um, and it's a really nice example of how deformation is strain rate dependent. 
So where you, where you deform these things fast enough, they fracture. Where you deform them slowly, they bend. Um, but uh, anyway, that's just another little uh, um, uh, sort of aside. Um, the, so the, 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 this one here is a, um, this, this is a close up of a fragment of this, this material from very close to this locality. This is another XRF map. This is a, a manganese iron calcium map. Garnet shows up orange in here. Um, and the green color is sulfide. Um, so um, you can see that, that here the sulfide has almost completely permeated the rock, particularly along the garnet rich bands. And what you can also see, I'll show you a bit more of this in a minute, is that we're also seeing magmatic textures within the sulfides themselves. So, um, so moving on, here's the process taken a little bit further. This is the sulfide now completely permeating the gneiss, forming a the sulfide's now essentially forming a matrix um, with um, the residual layering of the gneiss preserved within it. Um, and uh, th these, these intervals can be several meters thick. Um, so this is what's called in the mine, it's called stringer ore, I prefer to call it infiltration ore. Um, and let's have a look at a close up of it. This is another XRF map. Um, and here, this is garnet here in blue. The sulfides are in these sort of orangey colors. Um, and the more refractory material here in the green and black, these are basically um, peroxine plagioclase rocks, um, mafic granulite. So these things are refractory. Um, they don't melt, but the more politic stuff does. Um, that's a phase map, and the same thing, so you can see that a little bit more clearly. Um, uh, sulfide preferentially invading the least refractory layers. Um, and then finally, this is a, a, a map showing of the, of the sulfides. Um, and um, you can see here that's uh, a pyrotite in blue, the pink's pentlandite, um, and the greeny colors are chalcopyrite. Um, and these textures that you can see here are what we call loop textures. Um, and um, again, cutting a long story short, um, we now think that these are essentially magmatic textures. These are forming by a peritectic reaction between the sulfide liquid um, and the early formed monosulfide solid solution, the early formed nickeliferous pyrotite. Um, they reacted around about 850 degrees to form the pentlandite. Um, and the evidence that this is a magmatic process is that these loops are made up of chalcopyrite and pentlandite together. Um, and uh, we have a paper in, uh, in, in, in press in economic geology on this. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to, to flick you a copy. Um, so, um, so what we're seeing here is a consequence of relatively slow, um, clearly um, long time duration percolation of the sulfide into the country rocks. Um, but what we've also seen is that from, from the textures of the, of, of the peroxines and the silicates, um, is the solidification of the, sul of the silicate is actually quite fast. So how do we actually reconcile these processes together? Um, before we do, I just want to show you one other feature. Um, and that is at the edge of these infiltration ore bodies, we quite often see um, felsic pegmatites that quite commonly develops along the margins of these features. And here's a beautiful smoking gun example. Here's the margin of a sulfide vein. Um, here's a felsic leucosome layer developed within migmatitic paranise. Um, and here you can say that that leucosome is actually draining out um, into the wall of the sulfide vein. So what do we think is going on? Well, here's the, the initial phase, the injection of the intrusion. Um, and we think that when, when, the, when, when the magma came in to form the, uh, the lower intrusion, it was actually carrying sulfide with it at this early stage. So rather than the sulfide liquid dropping into some sort of pre-existing container on trap sites, we think the sulfide's there all along. In fact, it may be that sulfide's actually a major agent of the actual erosion, erosion and emplacement of the intrusion, but that's a story for another day. Um, the key thing here is that the time of emplacement of the intrusion, the country rocks are an extension, um, and they're at their solidest temperature. They're already starting to melt. Um, so we start to generate fractures. The sulfide injects its way into these fractures, um, heats up the country rock even further. Country rocks are already pretty much at its melting point for, before this even starts. So the extra heat from the sulfide pushes it over the top. That generates melting within the less refractory bands of the gneiss. That melt drains out uh, to form these leucosome patches along the walls of the veins. Uh, meanwhile, in places where you've had really intensive injection of sulfide, the melting front at the top is where we form these soft, soft wall breaches, where fragments of the gneiss actually become detached and float off into the sulfide. Um, now, an interesting process about this sulfide infiltration is it's self-reinforcing. Um, I'll just back up to the previous slide to show you what I mean. Um, the longer these sulfide veins get, um, the higher is the, um, the, the, the higher is the, the rise height of the interconnected sulfide liquid, which means that the hydrostatic head which is what's driving the sulfide into the fractures, gets bigger. So there's a feedback loop here, which causes the sulfide veins to propagate, uh, essentially under their own weight, um, into the country rock. Right, so um, 
Now let's start. To, let, let, let's let's go back now. We're into the home straight here. Let's get back to thinking time scales and length scales again. What sort of time scale do these processes happen at? So, um, so it's all about the thermal regime that we're sitting in. Um, and um, we can actually start to put some numbers on time scales involved here by just applying a, a, a little bit of really basic physics. So one of the things we can do first is to do a very, very simple heat conduction model. Um, so, this, so this is for 100 meters thick sill injected into country rocks at 850 degrees. You can just do a simple finite element model for that. That's what the model on the left is. Um, and what that tells you is that, that to cool the magma in the sill down to its solidest temperature, which is the temperature recorded by the symplectites, remember, that process takes somewhere around about a thousand years. It's a pretty quick process. So the initial stages of the cooling are quite fast, um, and we can see that on this plot here. So, um, so the, the, the plot that I'm showing you here on the right is just, a, it's just time, log scale time on, 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 on the x-axis, temperature on the y-axis. Here's the initial cooling of the intrusion. That's a thousand years there. Um, so we cool our intrusion fairly quickly down to ambient temperatures. But here's where it gets interesting, because this is the melting range of the sulfide shown here in the red box. So we can see that when we get down to ambient temperature, the sulfides are still molten. Now the cooling, the time scale for cooling from here on has got nothing at all to do with the cooling of the intrusion. The time scale now is governed by the cooling of the origin as a whole. It's governed essentially by the exhumation rate. How fast do, um, do, do, does, do, does this big body of deep crustal rocks um, actually take to get um, close enough to the surface that it starts to cool down significantly? Now we know, um, I don't have time to go into this, so I'll just give you the results, but um, so a very nice piece of, of thermochronology work was done by um, Liz Skibiorski, a PhD student at Curtin Uni a couple of years ago. Um, and what she found by applying different kinds of geochronometers that measure different metamorphic temperatures, um, that the cooling rate is something of the order of tens of degrees for a million years for the, for, for, uh, for, for the Arby and Fraser origin as a whole. We don't really know what it is just here, um, but we know elsewhere along the origin that's what it was. Um, in other words, these, the, 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 the time scale for cooling along this part of the curve, where the sulfides were still molten, this is probably of the order of a million years, perhaps even more. So the sulfides essentially had all the time in the world um, to actually do, um, to, to, to do the work that they're doing. So now let's, uh, let, let, let's put all of this together um, and look at some of these things on our, uh, on our gesogram, and we're, we're, we're near the end now. Um, so here are our zone peroxines. Um, where they plot on this diagram, we think is that they, they probably grew on the order of sort of our, our, our hours to days. Um, they're sort of centimeter sized grains, somewhere around about here. They're sort of sitting on the slow side of the chemical diffusion control line. Solidification of the, of the intrusion is up here. That's uh, sort of 1,000 years for 100 meter or so um, intrusion. Solidification of the sulfide, that's happening on time scales of, of, of a million years or so. Percolation of the sulfide, physics of this is a little bit more complicated, but it's, um, we, can, we can do a fairly sort of simple approximation just basically as a Darcy law um, kind of percolation experiment. Um, and um, we get a quite, quite a range. Um, the sulfides which are actually percolating through the cumulates in the intrusion, that's happening at high temperature. Viscosities are relatively low. Um, so that's probably happening on a time scale of years. But um, the sulfide migration through the country rock, the infiltration textures, what's controlling those is the viscosity of the most viscous melt. And these are the leucosomes, which are percolating out. Um, so if we make a bit of a guess at those, we can estimate that the time scale to form these kinds of things is probably the order of, of, of thousands of years, perhaps tens of thousands of years, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, somewhere in that, uh, somewhere in that sort of range. But what we know is that we've got all of the time we need because this is all happening on the time scale of the exhumation of the origin. And that's way up here um, on, on the time scale of tens of millions of years. So here's the punchline. So the, the, the stage at which the sulfide is cooling and solidifying percolating is actually happening not on the time scale of the, of, of the injection of the intrusion, but over the millions of years it takes to cool the entire body of deep crustal rocks. Um, so that's pretty much the story, and that, that's about where I want to leave it. Um, so um, just some general conclusions about NOVA. NOVA sulfides are extensively developed within the football rocks. The reason for that is primarily due to primary magmatic processes, although there is, a, there is a fair bit of tectonic overprint as well, which I haven't had time to talk about. That's happening probably at the same time as um, these primary magmatic processes are happening. In placement with syntectonic, metamorphic, in country rocks close to their solidus temperature, the sulfide liquid spend a long time cooling through its melting range. Um, and the distinctive features of NOVA are due to this high temperature in placement, an exceptionally prolonged cooling path and deformation during emplacement. So going back now to the, um, the time scale plot um, and just wrapping up the whole story, 
Um, magma flow is the fastest of all of the essential processes which form our deposits. The rate of melting of zeniths is an important control on sulfide liquids. Sulfide liquids can be transported um, within melting zeniths. Um, sulfide droplets settle or segregate much faster than they can equilibrate. So um, our sulfide can be transported a long way from the original source, um, but once you actually start to form the sulfide liquid, um, you don't have a lot of time to react it with the magma. So all formation requires multi-stage recycling in long-lived transcrust or conduit systems. Um, and if you want to read a bit more about that, that's the QR code that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is the paper, Time Scales and Length Scales Magma Flow Pathways, the Origin of Magmatic Liquid Copper PGEO Deposits. Um, by me and Jesse Robertson, and that was in Geoscience Frontiers. That's an um, that's a, that's a, a open access paper, so you can download it anytime you like. Um, and um, I'll leave you with, the, with, with these final thoughts. Scaling relationships are key, kinetics matter. Um, this is a really useful way to think about mineral systems or any other geological processes. So um, thanks to my collaborators. Thanks to you all for listening. And um, I'm very happy to um, take whatever questions you'd like to throw at me. <laughs>